Hi, Shanna Forstall here. Welcome back to Be a Better Human podcast. My topic today is a faith taste test. It's kind of a tongue twister, <laughs> but it's something I've been thinking about recently. And I, in looking at our world, I realized that one of the things we're most passionate about, but sometimes not compassionate about, is religion. And people have very strong beliefs about what they believe and they don't believe. And I thought that talking to someone who's recently undergone a faith taste test could help us maybe have a little more compassion passion and a little more empathy and a little more admiration maybe of how someone else believes or lives. My guest today is someone who's very special to me, Nikki Levens, uh, Nicole Levens. We call her Nikki Love. Nicole Levens is a what I like to call a quadruple threat. Not only is she beautiful, she is intelligent, she is extremely talented. She's a singer-songwriter. She has a beautiful voice. She's a talented actress and producer. And more than any of that, she is someone who is compassionate and passionate all at the same time. So I'd like to introduce her to you today. I can't wait for you to get to know her. Nicole Levins is my guest today. My topic is Faith Taste Test. I'm again speaking to you from the Women's City Club in Pasadena, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Well, at least in Pasadena. I'm happy to be here and I'll be right back with Nikki. Hi, Shanna Forstall here with Be A Better Human, and my guest today, as I told you earlier, is Nicole Levins. We like to call her Nikki Love, (laughs) and we're here today to talk about a faith taste test. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Don't try to say it three times. But um, Nikki, so I had already been thinking about this, and you know, faith is one of those things that people get super passionate about, but not so compassionate about. So when you and I talked and you told me that you were celebrating Ramadan, first I was like, whoa, you converted to Islam and didn't tell me? (laughs) Which I totally would have believed. (laughs) But then you told me that, no, you were just celebrating to learn from the the religion and the faith. And I want to hear more about that. So tell me, what was the catalyst getting you to do this little faith taste test? I would say the catalyst, well, two catalysts, actually. (laughs) When I've, I've always obviously known about Ramadan, right. um, not very in depth, but I moved to Los Angeles about four years ago and I met this incredible woman randomly a week before I moved at my going away party. Mm-hmm. And she was there with another friend and she and I just got to talking about faith and spirituality and how we had grown up in the Baptist community and how even though we had grown up in this one particular faith, we never really felt connected to it, Mm. but we always felt connected to a higher power and ultimate source. And so she expressed to me that she, one of the most profound religious experiences that she had was Ramadan. Hmm. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting because she's not Muslim. Same thought occurred to me. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know people practice Ramadan who weren't Muslim. And so that was very interesting and intriguing to me. And so she explained what it looked like, the fasting for 30 days and then, you know, the prayer. She did the full out Ramadan experience. I opted mostly to do the fasting from sunup to sundown. And then every so often I would journal or I would, I found myself praying a lot more, being more in a space of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the things that I found really helpful in the moments where I was experiencing hunger. It reminded me of all the people who would lack in that area of their lives who may not eat a meal for several days. And especially living in a country like America, we live in a very gluttonous, privileged society. And we don't think about something as simple as food Mm -hmm. because it's so readily available to us. That's not a thing that we see as a blessing that we get to Mm. experience every single day just to eat. And so really just breaking down the simplicity of eating and looking at it from that way was just mind-blowing. And the fact to consciously go without something, there's power Mm. in that decision, in that choice. And so I really looked at the Muslim faith a lot differently because Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam and it's a center focus of their faith. And it's something that is done once a year. And I don't know, I feel like it's one of those things that I'm going to probably adopt from their faith moving forward because I found a lot of value in the 30 days of fasting. Um, I found a lot of value of me always having to redirect Mm. and refocus my energy Mm -hmm. in that moment of hunger, in that moment of despair. And I 
there were a lot of blessings that happened to me during that month. Um, right. People who have done Ramadan speak about that all the mm-hmm. time, about the blessings and the revelations and all of these things that happen as a result mm-hmm. of you, of your lack, you know, as a result right. of you consciously making a decision to go without something. And so for me, holistically, it was a game changer yeah. for sure. That's wonderful. So what would you say were the biggest challenges during that time? You know, anytime we make a sacrifice or we decide to take a different path or choose something that's difficult to do, right, there's there's challenges. Tell me what your challenges were during those 30 days. Hmm. Besides the obvious. Right. I know. And, and, and here's the thing. I mean, that had to be difficult. You not eat. Yes. <laughs> and some days were harder than others. The hardest thing was the compulsion. Mm in it because it's like, okay, I can't have anything from sun up to sundown, but there are genuinely moments where, okay, it's really hot today and right. I've been running all day right. and I've, I'm on set or whatever. Right. And your energy level or your body physically mm-hmm. cannot do that. Right. And so I found myself, I've had to break fast maybe four or five mm-hmm. times during the 30 days and that completely happened. Right. But I had to remind myself not to get so upset right. when that happened. Like right. you have to listen to your body. Like you're not fasting to starve yourself. Right. Like that's not the purpose. Right. And there is no compulsion in Allah, as people will tell you in that faith. And so it's like, yes, you're fasting, you're fasting for a purpose, but it's also being mindful and respecting your body and respecting your space. Like that's also a part of Ramadan. So for me, it was just the hardest part was just remembering why I was doing it. And it's not eating. That's right. not why I'm doing right. it. It's a bigger purpose. There's a bigger lesson and message in why I'm choosing to fast right now. And so that was the hardest part of constantly having to like, all right, remember mm. why I'm doing this. Right. It's not just the not eating. That's the simplest part about it, actually. And it's not even the hardest part. (laughs) You would think it is because once you get through it, it becomes your routine at a certain point in time. So would you say that you went into this looking to maybe try something with discipline? Like, was it about disciplining your mind or your body, about sacrifice, about being maybe more present? It was about sacrifice for sure. And one of my main goals throughout the 30 days was I personally, I'm not sure if anyone out there can relate, but I bet you can. I have an issue with what you just said was focusing on the now, staying in the moment. It's very hard for me. I can learn from my past and apply that to my future. And I can always dream and like know where I'm headed, but I have a really hard time staying in the moment and really being where I am. And that can be a difficulty because where you are is going to get you (laughs) to where you're trying to go. And you may miss the blessing that's happening around you because you're so focused about what's going to happen in the future. And that was one of the things that I really wanted to focus on this month was really learning how to be where I am. And as simple as that sounds, it is one of the hardest things to do. (laughs) That's why there's so many meditation apps out there. So many yoga classes because <laughs> any other humans out there have trouble being present? No, I think we all struggle with that, Nikki. I mean, that's definitely a common problem in humanity. I mean, we have a mind and so it goes yeah. backwards and it goes forward. Yeah. And I think, you know, some people always think about the past and regret. A lot of people, uh, me, I'm a worrier about the future. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, if I'm not here, I'm like worrying 10 years out. Right. I'm like, right. what is Shanna? You know, and I will literally miss the present because mm-hmm. of that sometimes. So I, that's, you're correct. It's something that we struggle with and I think that it requires the discipline and, and it requires practice, yes. which is what you did yes. with Ramadan, which is mm-hmm. why I'm, I love the whole concept of it. You know, I, I try to do it on a daily basis, just try to make myself present by using my senses or taking a minute to meditate and, you know, where am I? And then incorporating gratefulness. Yes. Like you were saying, did you find, because that's something I always try to work on mm-hmm. is gratefulness. It's so easy to complain. It is. Oh my gosh. And then you're like, is. wait, I'm driving a car. car. Mm-hmm. I don't have to walk to, I have shoes on my feet. I slept in a bed last mm-hmm. night in an air conditioned house mm-hmm. with a husband who loves me and a cat who wants to snuggle. Like, what do I really have <laughs> to, to complain, complain about, about, right? Exactly. And yet we have all these first world problems. Oh my God. Starbucks took too long on my coffee. Like yeah. literally what are we complaining about? And so for me to just pull myself back to the present is important. Yes. I, when I used to travel all the time, I take pictures. I have these pictures I used to hang in my houses. Is one was a lady in Sri Lanka washing clothes in a bucket and I would hang it near my washer and dryer, mm-hmm. like to remind myself yeah. like 
Are you, are you going to complain? Really? Yeah, right? Are you going to complain about turning the laundry I on? Know. Like, oh, God, I, I got to sort the whites and the darks. I know. Ah, I know. Isn't right? it wild? It's crazy. It's, it's really crazy, but I feel like that's why, for me, Ramadan was so important. And it doesn't have to be Ramadan for anybody yeah. out there because the Christian faith, you know, practices something very similar. Lent. Right. You're not giving right. up food, but you're giving up something right. for 40 days. And so when you look across religions, they mm. all practice this. Yes. <laughs> In one way, shape, or form. And so there's something to be said for the beauty of sacrifice. Just to remind you, I had a huge aha moment that just came to me mm-hmm. again. Because I think I told you I've been, I documented I the entire 30 days. I videoed every single day. And so I'll be cutting that up together. So maybe I can send that to I you. I love and you can it. Post yes, it with, I'm with your, it. Yeah, for sure. And the final day, the revelation that I had was through fasting and through the sacrifice was, oh, my God. I already have everything that I want Mm. and that I've asked for and that I've dreamed of. I literally already have it. I'm already existing in that space. And so everything moving forward is nothing but a blessing. Everything moving forward Mm. is the cherry on top because I have already been blessed beyond many, many lifetimes. And so I was literally in tears (laughs) in in this video because it was just... It was that moment. It was like, oh, my God, like, how do I ever go through any day anymore without yeah. being so grateful just for waking up? Because I literally remember as I was standing in my apartment in the middle of L.A., I realized I was standing inside of my dream. Mm. I can remember being a little girl laying in my bed, dreaming about being an actress in Los Angeles mm. and dreaming about having my studio apartment in the city with my view of the hills and I could right. see the Hollywood sign and, like, windows everywhere and so like you know days are hard sometimes yeah, we all absolutely. have those this moments city's a city of hustle it's yeah work. it's not like you're sitting around exactly right? we all have those moments even in the midst of our gratitude where we're a little complainy right. you know that's <laughs> or start, discouraged yeah tired, exactly exactly and we have those moments and they're okay don't stay right. and dwell in that space right. but you know it's something that's so profound about genuinely being grateful for where you are because that is important. Where you are is just as important about where you came from. It's right. just as important as where you're going. Right. The past, the present, and the future, they all rise up to meet us here, which yeah. is the present. They don't exist without each other. And if other. we're not careful, we'll miss it. You know, I've had times in my life yep. where when I was in them, they were so difficult that I thought, I just can't wait to get out of this. I can't get wait to the, get out of this and for things to change. But then when they changed, I would actually miss some things about that time. Mm-hmm. And I know when I look back at the hardest times in my life, you know, Breathe, my short film, looks back at one of those seasons. That was not my literal story, but it was a figurative story. And I remember that season of my life, it was so painful. Like, I literally didn't know how to breathe every day. And yet, I experienced beauty in a way... <laughs> that I had never experienced it before. I remember standing at a, the Monterey Aquarium and just looking at the jellyfish and just crying and crying and crying at how beautiful they were mm-hmm. when they breathed and how simple it was for them to breathe and how beautiful they were just for breathing. And I would just talk to myself, like, Shanna, just, just keep breathing. Mm-hmm. Just keep breathing. The pain's going to pass. The trauma's going to pass. You're going to get better. It's not going to look so dark anymore. If you just keep breathing, you're beautiful just for being alive. Yeah. You know, if they're beautiful, we're beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, I, and now I look at humans in a new way, especially humans who are suffering for whatever reason, with physical challenges. I've been dealing lately with chronic pain, and sometimes I just have to go back to the center myself and go, okay, you're here. Just breathe through it. You know, just breathe through it. It's not always going to look like this. And the way you're experiencing the world right now is a gift. Yeah. You know, it's changing the structure, the fabric, the core of who I am. And I'm so grateful for it because I really think that these terrible experiences <laughs> are making me the human that I want to be. And they're never they really, really terrible. Are. No. And when you look back they're at it, really you're like, are. it was horrific feeling. But it was necessary. But the gift, mm-hmm. the gift that it gave me. Like, I yep. literally can look at myself in the mirror these days and go, I like you. I don't just like you. Yeah, I love, love you. you. And you're funny. And you're kind. And I like the human being that you are. And I, I really think that if I hadn't gone through some of those 
horrific experiences, you know, that I wouldn't be the same person. And so there's always the gift in that moment. Let's get back to faith a little bit. So you, you were talking about how faiths are similar, and they are, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of similarity between faiths. And so what might be some other ways? I know you took on Ramana, which I think is lovely. But what are some other ways that maybe someone out there who's wanting to kind of do a faith taste test and try something on or find a new appreciation for someone else's faith or way of believing or living? How could we do that? What are some ideas for that? Because I like to get practical to Yeah, class. research and education. It's going to mm. sound really funny, but everything is a Google search and click mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nowadays, we're so connected yeah. to each other. I mean, if you're a social media person, you can hashtag everything yeah. and you'll find real people out there mm-hmm. through their stories and figure out who yeah. they are and what they're going through in real time. And I think... You know, in the society that we live in now, where we are all so connected through technology, there is no rhyme or reason why we can't try to at least understand mm-hmm. or come to some sort of common ground or at least respect yeah. each other's differences because it's out there and yeah. people are willing to share and right. experience right. with you and show you their culture so you right. can, you know, take that faith walk and really, you know, see something else through someone else's eyes that you may not have experienced before. For me, it was easy because I've always been interested in things that are different. Right. I'm drawn to that. So I'm open when it comes to experiencing different lifestyles and cultures and religions. I want to have a little taste of it all because I genuinely I feel like at the end of the day, we are all more alike than we ever will be different. Right. That's great, Nikki. And I just wanted to follow up. So being from the South... You're a woman of color. <laughs> yes. yes. What gave it away? <laughs> and today is Juneteenth. Juneteenth, yes. Happy Juneteenth, Yay. everybody. So I just, I wanted to ask you how maybe being a woman of color from the South may have influenced your life and your view on life and the way that you kind of walk the world with compassion and openness. Yes. So I feel like absolutely me being a woman of color growing up in the South has absolutely shaped me. Just like everybody else on this planet, our experiences shape who we are. And for me, I grew up in the South, New Orleans, (laughs) Louisiana, very traditional Baptist Mm. family when it comes to religion. And my family was the first family. We had our own pew in the church. And like my grandmother was the head of the choir and played the piano for the church. So I always had to be in church all the time, Bible study on Thursdays, Sunday school for the kids, plus the normal service. We did all those things. But because we were a first family so connected with things being organized in the church, I got to see the people, the heads of the church, outside of the church. Right. And so that's where the problems came in for me because I would see those leaders in the church behaving in such a way that was not Mm Christian-like, that was not godly, not of the church, as we would say. And so that became problematic for me. And I would question things and I would have my pastors or my uncles who were, you know, in that faith as well, you know, explain to me, oh, we're not meant to understand the mind of God or like we're only supposed to interpret the Bible through, you know, the shepherd's eyes, which were the pastors and, and, you know, that whole thing. Women had to wear skirts and dresses and stockings. We weren't allowed to wear pants in church. We had to wear the little doilies on our head and gloves. And so all these silly little ritualistic things that don't really matter when it comes to your actual faith (laughs) at the end of the day. And so like that was problematic for me because... I'm like, how can this be? How can this person stand up here every Sunday and say these words to me, but they're not living that Mm -hmm. in their everyday life? Mm -hmm. And so I grew up that way in that community, but then I also attended Catholic school. So now I'm learning, you know, the whole Catholic side of things. And like when you learn church history and church doctrine oh my god the catholics like murdered people (laughs) to like gain the the power and influence that the vatican has and that the catholic church has and so for me it's like oh my god that's one of the ten commandments like how is this okay and we're not gonna talk about that no okay all right so for me it was just it became this thing and then outside of that i've always just been very naturally spiritually connected mm. to the other side of the veil <laughs> as it were and right. I would I would see spirits growing up I would be connected to that side of things I would experience and feel things that the untrained eye right. would normally be connected to and so when I would ask questions about that those in my family who were 
ministers or deacons or whatever, if they weren't experiencing it, it couldn't obviously be real because they are a true, you know, shepherd of God. And but clearly I'm not because I haven't gone to whatever, you right. know, theological school and blah 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 and I'm not a man. <laughs> so you're not you're, you're, I know, <laughs> right? So, you know, the combination of those three things really helped to shape my thought process because I always felt connected to other. I always felt Mm. connected to something else outside of religion. Religion felt very restricted to me. And it it always felt silly. Honestly, I I hope I'm not offending anybody, but it always, church always felt silly for me. It still feels very silly for me. It feels unnecessary for me. Right. But I understand that other people don't feel that way. And that's great. Have some sort of faith and connectivity mm-hmm. to something. I think that's important. But for me, I don't feel it necessary to go to church every Sunday and right. wear a dress and a hat and hoop and holler. Right. I just, I don't need that. We can I, find different ways to, yes. just to display our faith, to exactly. connect to faith. I know for me, it's nature. I mean, if I'm yes. in, in a park or in gardens or hiking the canyons or at the beach or exactly. whatever, that's when I feel most connected to source. I'm right? the same way, exact same way. Yeah. So I just have always known that there is something deeper that connects us all that goes far beyond religion, which is man made. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorry, guys. You know, someone else is telling us to believe in this. That has nothing to do with the power and the connectivity to source because you already have that within you. That connection and that relationship is something that is very personal, individualized to each person, but it's also the ties that bind us. Mm. And so I think when it comes to any religion or any spiritual experience, if it does not connect you and ground you to you, that then also comes with out of out of you and connects you to the other people mm. and nature and to these other beings on this planet, then right. it is not of God. Right. Because it's not real. Yeah. And so, and we can, and you know, people have different ways of, of connecting to faith. Like we just talked yeah. about and manifesting their faith and practicing their faith. Yes. And that's all fine. You know, some people love to go to church and love the community of gathering with other people and singing or doing whatever. And that's great. Yes. But, it but is. like Nikki said, maybe it's, it's us kind of checking ourselves. It's like, is what I'm connecting to making me a better human? Is it making me have more love in my life, more compassion? Is it helping me to understand myself better? And then helping me to connect to the other humans that God has given me to share the earth with. (laughs) Exactly. Because at the end of the day, what most religions teach, and I think I may have mentioned this earlier, I'm not sure, so I'll say it again because it's important. But they're all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Love yourself. Yeah, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's being a human. That is practicing, not only practicing, but respecting Mm -hmm. humanity. And that's all we need at the end of the day. You know, if we can just get over ourselves and get over our egos and get over pride, that really has no place to sit at the table with us. None of that has any place at the table when it comes to being a human and making sure that we are all okay. At the end of the day, everybody wants the same thing. Right. Right. We want the same thing. We want to be okay, healthy, happy, and whole, and we want our loved ones to be the same. Right. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. So I have a favor to ask. (laughs) Today is Juneteenth, and you guys don't know, but or you may not know. You probably heard it while she was talking. She has this really beautiful voice. (laughs) Um, But it's really lovely when she sings. And Nikki, I was wondering if you would sing a song for us, like something to do with love. I don't know, something to do with faith, something something that means something Mm -hmm. to you. Okay, I'm totally going to steal something from Beyonce's Coachella performance. Fantastic! (laughs) In the spirit of Juneteenth. I love it. Yeah. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. (laughs) Yes. Lift every voice and sing to let them heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let I rejoice. And you just had church. (laughs) (laughs) Shanna Forstall here with Be a Better Human with my little sister and beautiful, lovely songbird, Nicole Events. If you haven't started following her yet, follow her on social media. She's a talented performer 
and a beautiful human. <laughs> and she will inspire you to be a better human as well. Thanks for being on, Nikki. Thank you for having me. Have a good day, everybody.